Yeah, I think that uh, uh, Simon Lei is uh, already ready for today his uh, presentation now. And uh, I also uh, saw our five very important and experienced uh, panelists, our expert here with us. Uh, the first one is uh, Professor Fayez. How are you? Nice to see you. Hello. And second one is uh, Dr. Professor Frank Chen. Hello. <clears throat> Hello, Frank good night, Chen. everyone. Yes. And then is the Professor Jordan Stamberg. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Oh. Very early. Yeah, thank you. And then is from Japan, Professor Kyutoku. Professor Kyutoku. Uh, you can share your screen with us. Uh huh. Hello, hello. Okay. Never mind. I think today our webinar will. Uh, start in three minutes. Yes, so we have some time to take a break. And then we are so happy. Uh, today's webinar is our fifth, the five zero, the fifth webinar since the COVID nineteen. So the ICC webinar uh has begun uh all from the twenty uh twenty. Yeah, so this webinar already uh, proceed uh, for two more years. Oh, I saw, I saw you. I see you, Professor Kyotoku. How are you? Hi, you can turn on your voices. <laughs> Good night. Yeah, so now I think, oh, hello. Uh, our participant is uh, coming. And the Professor Low is coming already. Hello, Professor Low. Hi. Hi. Hi, Brian. Good to see you again. Uh, uh, good to see you. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, one minute. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, thank you for coming from all over the world. from. Um, America, Japan, uh, England, yeah, from uh, Middle East Asian and Southeast Asia, yeah, anywhere. So actually, I I am so happy to have today's the, our fifth webinar so far. Uh huh. So if you are. Okay, you can show everyone the a smile now with, with us. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, don't be shy, please. Uh huh. Uh, thank you. Okay, Doctor Honda. Uh, how are you? Hi, and uh, Doctor Vanna. Hello, Doctor Timor. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think it's almost time to begin uh, today's our webinar. <clears throat> uh -huh. Okay. Oh, the first question is already on our chat room <laughs> so quickly. <laughs> Okay, thank you. So it's time. Good morning and uh, good evening, all my good friend from ICC. Thank you for joining. Today is a very special day because today's webinar is ICC's fifth five zeros the online webinar and to give the lecture for all uh, the those who need the lecture or the any video demonstration and to give us a more continuous the uh, medical educational and then we are so happy i am dr p y uh, and my colleague dr junior too uh, so we both welcome to icc webinar today uh, professor Brian Somerlid is an honorary consultant plastic surgeon at, at Great Almond Street Hospital for Children, London, and at the St. Andrews Century for Plastic Surgery, Broomfield Hospital, Chelmsford, 
He was the first clinical director of the North Thames Clip, Lip and Palate Service and is the chairman of the charity CLEPT. He has been particularly involved in the development of the operating microscope for CLEPT palate repair and in refining surgery for repair of the muscles CLEPT palate and in re repairing the CLEPT palate as an alternative to pharyngoplasty in some patients. He regularly visit countries where CLEP lip and palate services are less well developed to work with local surgeons and to assist in their development of multidisciplinary teams. He works regularly with CLEP teams in Bangladesh, Egypt, Sri Lanka, Iran, the Kurdish region of Iraq, and the Uganda. He was co-founder and now chairman of CLEPT, a charity established in 2007 to fund the research activities of the Great Almond Street St. Drew CLEPT Lip and Pilot Team, and also to support the activities of teams in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Uganda, Egypt, and the Kurdish region of Iraq. The CLEPT aimed to bridge the gap physically in, in, in enabling surgical repair, scientifically in funding research, which aimed to bridge gap in knowledge and internationally in helping to bridge the gap between the care available to children born with CLEP in poorer countries and the care available in countries such as the UK. Today, we are so honored to have Dr. Somalit with us to present the topic CLEP palate repair. Also, five important and experienced CLEP surgeons are invited to the panel. The first one is Dr. Fayyaz from Lahore, Pakistan. The second is Dr. Frank Chen from Chang'e Memorial Hospital, Taiwan. The third one is Dr. James Seward from Dallas Children's, United States. The fourth is Dr. Jordan Stamberg from Nicholas, Children's Hospital, United States. And the final one is the Dr. Shinjiro Kyutoku from Nara Hospital, Japan. The webinar will begin with Professor Samale's presentation and followed by panel discussion. And then it's the QA session. Of course, finally, we will end up with the group photo. So can wait to learn from Professor Samale. So Professor Priest. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the welcome. Uh, very nice to see a number of old friends. Um, so can I, can I share yes. my screen? Please. So thank you. Um, we'll just move over a little. Um, I don't know whether might be better on the side. Um, so I, I I've been asked to talk about the palate repair, uh, which uh, and some of you may have heard me talking before, and I apologise if. This is repetitive to some extent because obviously I haven't got a. There's always something new to say, but uh, there's no major changes. Uh, disclosure: I, as as uh, Hang Yon said, I'm uh, chairman of a UK charity, but I receive no personal benefit. So first, I want to say something about instruments and magnification for palate repair. Um, I. Uh, when I began as a trainee, used to use these little Zeiss Jena loops to do a palate repair. Uh, and then uh, I advanced to uh, rather better loops with longer focal lengths and a headlight. But if you can see the position I'm in, it's very uncomfortable. But I would suggest that 
the uh, that loops are the, the the at least the minimum um, for a, a pallet repair. But since 1991, I've used wherever I possibly can the operating microscope, uh, and it doesn't have to be a particularly sophisticated microscope. The advantages are that the light is in the right place, that you can variably magnify, so you can zoom up for the more difficult bits and down for the um, less precise bits, that it's a comfortable position for the surgeon, that the assistant can see what you're seeing. And that's very important because it's very difficult to teach a pallet repair um, when, the, when the assistant can't really see what you're doing. There's a monitor for anyone in the operating room to see, and you can take a record. I've said it's, it's like watching the, the difference between using the microscope and using loops is the difference between uh, watching the sun rising or the fog settling. And there are, are two other big advantages. It, it protects the surgeon's neck. More and more there's discussion about the ergodynamics of surgery. And I know a number of cleft surgeons who've had to give up uh, doing cleft surgery because of problems with their neck. And there was a recent paper um, by others, uh, Anna Murthy, Murthy and others in PRS, showing that the weight of the head, the more the, the, the neck is flexed, the heavier the head and the more strain it's putting on the cervical spine. So at 60 degrees, the 10 to 12 pound head becomes 60 pounds in, in, in pressure on the neck. So it protects the surgeon's neck, but also very importantly, it protects the patient's neck. So you don't have to hyperextend the patient. Uh, you can, the patient, the patient's head can be very little extended or not at all because the microscope's sitting ahead. And this was another important paper showing the effect of overextension of the neck on intracranial pressure. And I have a, a personal tragic experience of that where I um, was operating on a patient in Argentina and uh, I came into the operating room and the patient was very hyperextended it, it, it was the patient had um, Chiari malformation as it turned out and coned. Um, so very important not to hyperextend the neck. So it doesn't have to be a very complicated microscope. It needs to have a long focal length. So the one sort of microscope that you can't use is an is an ophthalmology microscope with a a, a ten centimeter or something like that focal length because the instruments are uh, bouncing off the off the uh, uh, the lens but it's a long focal length adjustable binoculars easy to adjust able to rotate sideways because you do need to look from side to side and ideally of course a sidearm for the assistant and a sidearm for a video so that it can be put up on a screen for Rotation for looking from side to side, of course, you also can move the patient's head from side to side. I don't know, are, are, the, are our images blocking the uh, this picture? I, I don't know what you're seeing. Okay, so uh, sterility. And some of the places where I work insist on putting a, a, a sterile cover on the microscope, which always takes time. All I do. And all we do in, in Great Ormond Street actually is to just put some sterile covers on the handles and, and, um, and, and nothing more, which saves a lot of time. This is actually in Suleymaniyah in Iraq. And uh, on the right um, in Egypt, just putting a, a, a little camera on top of the, the, the um, observers, the opposing binoculars just to take a, take a video. Um, sorry, can I just ask, are the, are the images of, the, of myself and, and you obstructing that 
that view? No, uh, no, Dr. Summerlad, the um, presentation. Okay, that is our mind. That's fine. Okay. Um, other instruments that are important, a mouth gag, which uh, doesn't obstruct the hands and doesn't obstruct the view of the surgeon. So this was a, a modification of the Dot Kilner gag, which we produced, which, um, and personally, I, I, I dislike the Dingman gag, which I don't like all the bits on the side that get in the way. Um, so this is a very simple gag. And an instrument set, this is one that's made uh, by a, a, a UK company, I'll mention the name, uh, Murray's. They give a, a, an, a royalty to our charity. I receive no personal financial benefit. The most important instrument is actually the smallest. I, I, I believe that the, 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 the way to dissect a, a palate is with a, is with a knife and a sharp blade. And um, quality of blades varies a lot, in fact. So um, this particular blade, the UK doesn't produce many things that are very high quality these days, but that's one thing that they do produce, um, Swan Morton blades. 15 blade. So I'm going to say something about anatomy, uh, first in normal anatomy and then cleft anatomy. So this is a, a cadaver dissection from uh, looking at the side, sorry, um, looking at from the side, um, this is posterior on the right, anterior on the left, skull base, so the, the mandible has been removed, the terry goods have been removed, and you're looking at the palate muscles from the side. So this is the tensor coming down forwards and medially hooking around the hamulus and forming the palatal aponeurosis, and behind it, the levator. And that's the important one. And note the slightly different color. And you do see that when you're operating. It, it's a, a more a sort of salmon pink color than, than, than red. Um, and this is a, an MRI scan taken at 60 degrees to the horizontal. So it's in the plane of the levator as the levator comes downwards and forwards. So here's one levator. Here's the midline. Here's the musculus uvulae. Here's the midline of the soft palate. This is the tongue. So levator, the tensor, which is not in the palate, you don't you don't see the tensor muscle, and the descending fibers of palatal pharyngeus. And this is a cadaver dissection uh, on the right, looking at. So we're now looking from behind. This is the back of the nasal septum. The uvula is down here somewhere, and just briefly to show you the circumferential fibers of palatal pharyngeus, which are those fibers which form passive on ridge, passing around the, the pharynx, the levator, and the tensor on the right side, not doing very much to the palate. We, John Borman and I uh, did some dis cadaver dissections back in the early 80s and the, published the a paper showing the position of the normal levator. And it's, in the, it's inserted in the middle third or middle 40% of the velum. So this is the nasal view of the, of the soft palate. This is the posterior nasal spine. This is the uvula. And here on the nasal side, so here's musculus uvulae. And just beneath that is the two are the two levators, and then more oral is the palatal pharyngeus. Middle forty percent. If you look at the cross section, histological cross section, like the the view on the from the MRI scan, you see musculus uvulae, mucus, a lot of mucus glands on the nasal side of the velum, and you can imagine if that muscle contracts, it then produces a convexity on the nasal surface of the velum. So this is the combined levator and uh, 
plato and the descending fibers of platypharyngeus. More laterally, the levator goes up and the platypharyngeus goes down. Uh, the tensor in the normal forms the palatal aponeurosis the, in the anterior third of the velum. And uh, this is the this is the palatal aponeurosis, this is the alveolus. In the cleft, the levator does not insert into the back of the hard palate, as is commonly stated. It does insert anteriorly into the margin of the cleft. And the reason why that is important is that if you think you've divided the levator from the back of the hard palate, you haven't. You've divided the platypharyngeus. I hear lots of people saying, I divided the levator from the back of the hard palate. And secondly, I don't think you can overlap the levator. Uh, you can overlap the platypharyngeus. So if we look at uh, this diagram, here on the left is the, is the levator, inserted anteriorly into the margin of the cleft. Here the, the platypharyngeus, which is inserted more anteriorly. So as you, as you divide those and retropose them, you've obviously got longer lengths of the platypharyngeus. So you can overlap platypharyngeus. The tensor in the cleft palate, I think has two components. There's a, a quite thin component that comes over the hamulus. Here's the pterygoid hamulus. And if you're doing a lateral release and you divide that structure, you release, you relax the oral layer. But deeply down on the nasal layer, inserted into the back of the hard palate, is the what I call the nasal component of the, of the tensor. The nasal mucosa has, um, has a, a, an important vascular supply. So here, dissecting in the plane between the muscle and the nasal mucosa, you see these little small blood vessels. So the, you know when you've got to the nasal mucosa, it's bluish in color, uh, almost translucent, and there's this very fine plexus of blood vessels. And I think very important that you keep, that you dissect in that plane, you keep those blood vessels intact and the, the integrity of the nasal mucosa intact. So that's a, an important surgical plane. The levator lies on the nasal mucosa. This is an example of a re-repair of a furlough where the muscle was, it was in, the surgeon had intended for the muscle on the side where it was attached to the oral mucosa to be retroposed, but actually he'd not gone, that he or she had not gone down to the nasal mucosa. So the levator, they moved back the platypharyngeus, but the levator was still inserted anteriorly. And the problem is, of course, that if you, and one of the reason that I personally don't do the, the, the furlough is that if you do get right down to that nasal mucosal layer with its vascular plexus, then on, on, the, on this side where we're showing that thin nasal mucosa, the nasal mucosal flap is very thin. It's, it's papery. When you try and do a, a, a Z-plasty, then you've, it's very difficult. I actually asked Philip Chen um, about, about what he, how he manages that. And he, he says that he leaves a little muscle behind on that side, on the side where he's removing the, where he's moving the, um, the muscle with the oral flap. A little bit about perioperative management. Uh, we, I, I stopped using arm splints a long time ago. We did a little randomized control trial, which is referred to there and showed no difference in fistula rate. And it makes the little, it, it, the babies are much happier without, without those arm splints. I really don't think they're necessary. And there was a nice paper from Japan where they actually had a camera above a baby having a after a pallet, after pallet surgery, after uh, I think they showed a number of babies, and the babies 
you know, put their hand to their mouth, but they very quickly realize that's not a good idea and they stop. They are not stupid. Uh, Tronic stomach acid, I think it's very valuable. Um, and we now use it routinely um, as an anti, to reduce blood loss. Um, 10 milligrams per uh, kilogram IV at induction and repeated as required six hourly. Very valuable and, and I think of no significant risk for, for, for children. Feeding, I allow the babies to feed with whatever they, they, they whichever technique they were using before, which may be breast um, in, 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 in rare cases, but uh, whatever bottle they were using, tend to give a, a first drink of water. Um, and sometimes they, they're better with baby food, with soft baby food than with, um, with fluid. Airway management, uh, obviously monitoring, and if in doubt, uh, nasopharyngeal airway as the, in perhaps the first post-operative post night, if there's worry about the nasal airway. Making sure that that nasal airway is at the right, in the right position, nasopharyngeal airway. <clears throat> you can just use an ET tube, split three ways. That's, uh, you don't need any, you don't need a, a special tube. So I'm going to just run through my operative technique. I like to repair pallets at the age of six months, um, if possible before the age of nine months. And the aim is two things, minimize harm and maximize function. You minimize harm by, of course, careful dissection of the soft palate, but also minimizing what you do to the hard palate. So I was taught the pushback, the, the Vaux, Wardle, Kilner pushback. That was the standard palate repair in the UK when I was a, 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 a trainee. I moved to doing uh, von Langenbeck's and then to doing mainly no incisions in the hard palate, no releasing incisions in most cases. And what made a big difference for me was beginning to use the Vomerine flap in unilateral and bilateral clefts at the time of lip repair. So using the Vomerine flap to repair the hard palate. Um, at, so this would be at the age of three months in, in most cases. And below left is, uh, elevating the Vomerine flap. Uh, and three months later at the time of palate repair, this is epithelialized. And you can see the junction between the palatal mucosa and this neomucosa that forms on the hard palate. I just lost my, my mouse, where's it gone? So th these are illustrations by David Lowe from CHOP, from Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, lovely illustrations that he's done for chapters. Um, uh, so that's a sort of standard, that's a three flap Vogue-Wardle Kilner pushback. I, I think it's a horrible operation. I'm, uh, I, it, it, it produces con contraction of the maxilla, almost certainly impairs maxillary growth. And if you get fistulae, they tend to be in this sort of area and they are very difficult to manage. It's, it's horrible. The two flap technique, very, the, the, the most common technique in the, in the United States, um, excuse me, is I think much less damaging, but I don't think it's necessary. And, and if you get fistulae in front of these flaps, they can be difficult to manage as well. The traditional long uh, von Langenbeck extended back into the soft palate. I no longer do that. I, I simply, if I need to do it, I, I, I do as little as possible and just extending around the back of the alveolus. <coughs> so in this series of um, isolated cleft palates, as you can see, I complete clefts, often U-shaped clefts, quite a high need for lateral re releasing incisions for von Langenbeck's, but past about there, virtually never. 
So that's minimizing harm in terms of damage to the hard palate. The key to maximizing function is what you do to the soft palate. I actually began, I think uh, you, you, you mentioned, um, Peng Yun, that I really began my palate surgery doing secondary palate surgery. Uh, I, when I was a trainee, I, used to, I started doing endoscopies um, in 1974 and looking at palates that looked, and I could tell that the muscles were not, had not been moved back. So I would suggest to my bosses, well, rather than doing some sort of frinkoplasty, how about doing a, just re-repairing those muscles? And I started doing re-repairs back in, in, at, that, at that stage and really learned about palate muscle correction from re-repairs. And then as I started operating on primary palates, I was tentative, conservative in what I did and then gradually became more radical. <clears throat> and as I've said, you, you, you do need to understand that anatomy. So I began by being conservatively rotating the muscle. Then I found it was much easier to repair the muscle, to dissect the muscle, if you first close the nasal myomucosal layer, because it's there a little, under a little tension and you can cut it more easily with the knife, you can dissect more easily with the knife. Then I began to leave some tissue in the midline to try and mimic that convexity of the, of the uh, normal velum, more definitive tensor tenotomy, more radical splitting of the platypharyngeus, and then more recently, exposing the nasal surface of the, of the levator uh, early in the procedure. I waited 25 years, really, before publishing the, the result because I wanted to be happy that, um, that in my hands, this seemed to be to work. So it was the, the primary technique was published in 2003. The, the re-repair technique was published in 1994. I'm just going to show you um, the steps in a, an isolated cleft palate repair. This is from a, a, a recent book. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, I can't see this. So Move it out. <coughs> this is from a, a, a book edited by um, Jordan Swanson and others, um, Global Cleft Care and Low Resource Setting. So this is um, a cleft of the soft palate. Even in a cleft of the soft palate, I will extend the incision forwards into the hard palate and, and elevate the oral mucoperiosteum from the back of the hard palate to get in the right plane. And then dissect back and really importantly, and, um, elevate these mucous glands. So if we go back to the palate, there are dimples at the back of the hard palate on this side. And this is where there are mucous glands, which are adherent to the back of the hard palate and the palatal aponeurosis. If you dissect subperiosteally and get between those beneath, in other words, nasal to those uh, mucous glands, you're then in the right plane where you can then separate the oral mucosa from the underlying muscle, which is the platypharyngeus anteriorly. If you, if you don't lift those mucous glands up, you get mucus and bleeding. So here we've elevated those mucous glands and exposed the nasal component of the tensor tendon on, on, on this side, on the right, <coughs> excuse me, and here uh, the greater palatine neurovascular bundle, which you can free as much as you need to. Uh, sorry, that was on the left. <laughs> on the right, um, using the knife, dissecting in that plane, between the mucous glands and the platypharyngeus. Then joining the nasal myomucosal layer. So that's now palatopharyngeus that you can see that on each side, this is the midline. So we've joined the nasal myomucosal layer. <coughs> Excuse me. Then making an paramedian incisions, which begin uh, a 
little more laterally posteriorly and then come towards the midline, of course, not dividing the sutures and then dissecting straight down till you get to the nasal myomucosal, to the nasal mucosal layer. Dividing from the back of the hard palate and dividing the tensor from the hamulus on each side. And this is one of David Lowe's illustrations for that book, um, showing the platypharyngeus on the, on the left and after and splitting of the platypharyngeus fibers on the right. <coughs> and now dissecting in a plane between the, the levator and the nasal mucosa, down to that nasal mucosa and its fine vascular plexus. Getting, once you're in that plane, it's a very nice bloodless plane. You can see little tiny fibers joining the, that nasal layer to the muscle. It's, it's, a, a, it's like all surgery. If you get in the right plane, it, 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 just, it just goes right. Here on, so this is the midline. And we're now looking again at the left side. Uh, this is the left levator. I just marked it with a bit of ink, which I sometimes do just to identify it <clears throat> when, I, when I retropose it. So having divided from the back, the, the plate of pharyngeus from the back of the hard palate, the tensor from the hamulus, and then dissecting, splitting the plate of pharyngeus. And as you do so, you expose the levator and here's the levator. And you can lift the, the platypharyngeus off it and expose the, the, the levator. So there, there's the levator, which has been now retro displaced. There's that nasal mucosal layer with its little vascular plexus, a consistent neurovascular structure here. I don't think it's critical by any means because I've, I've divided it many times and it doesn't appear to be any major problem, but I try and preserve it by dividing anteriorly a little bit. And I make a hole in that nasal mucosa if I haven't done it accidentally because I don't I don't want a closed space. I want I don't want a hematoma. And now here in the middle line is the united muscle. I use non-absorbable sutures. I'm joining it um, in actually further back than the middle 40%. The most anterior suture actually picks up the those fibers of the nasal component of the tensor, which gives a bit of strength to the repair. And then this, uh, and there is that in, in David Lowe's picture, that last muscle stitch, which includes the tensor tendon. And then this twisted loop mattress stitch between the oral layer and the nasal layer in front of the repaired muscle. And by putting the needle back through the loop of the, of the mattress uh, stitch, you halve the tension. And by twisting it, you avoid getting a, a big loop on the mucosa. Um, it's not just to reduce tension, it's just to bring, it brings the layers together. Um, and if you haven't tried it, try it. It really, it really works in a way that, for example, a normal mattress stitch won't do. And there's the closure. I'm just show a brief little bit of this. We haven't got time to show much, but just to give you, if you haven't seen it uh, under the microscope, the sort of clarity that you can that you can see. And as I said earlier, a sharp knife is the most important tool. So this is that paramedian <laughs> incision uh, till we get down to the nasal mucosa. I'm just about there now. There's the vascular plexus, but we haven't got time. Um, and I, I'll tell you where you can get a, a video um, if you wish to, uh, I can send it to you. So the essentials of the technique. Using the microscope, if possible. Lifting mucous glands from the back of the hard palate, dissection of the oral mucosa from the plate of pharyngeus, mobilizing the greater palatine neurovascular bundle if you have to. Limited lateral releasing incisions if necessary, 
the section by knife, not scissors. I only use scissors for cutting stitches. Closure of the nasal myo mucosal layer before the muscle dissection. Leaving those paramedian mucus glands to, to mimic the musculus uvulae. Dissecting in a plane between the nasal mucosa and the levator. Dividing the nasal component of the tensor tendon. Splitting the platypharyngeus. So some of the platypharyngeus fibers are left laterally inserted towards the uh, hamulus. Non-absorbable sutures to unite the muscle, especially the levator. Usually about four sutures, at least two, definitely going through the levator. Drainage holes in the nasal layer, if not accidentally. And that twisted loop mattress suture to join the, the oral and la nasal layer in front of the muscle to close the dead space and hopefully stop the muscle uh, pulling forwards. And you can go to either my website or better, better still, go to the charity website uh, and we, we'll, we can send you a, I can send you some, um, a USB with some, uh, a lip, unilateral lip repair, bilateral lip repair, palate repair, palate re-repair, et cetera. <clears throat> we no longer insert ventilation tubes, grommets at palate repair. I'll explain why. These are some recent chapters uh, with, with this technique. So the last edition of Comprehensive Cleft Care by Losey and Kirshner, the book I've just referred to and the illustrations I've used from uh, Swanson and Lowe and very recently um, uh, Interdisciplinary Cleft Care Global Perspectives edited by uh, Hamden et al. Uh, a few papers about outcomes. Um, I gave some outcomes in that paper in 2003, uh, wrote a paper with David Fisher in PRS in 2011. More recently in 2020, um, a series I'll show you the, the outcomes, a series of, of my palate repairs were reviewed, assessed independently by, um, by independent blinded speech and language therapists, speech pathologists. This is the paper in Cleft Palate Journal 2020, Bailey and, and Cell, but they weren't, they didn't do the assessment. They, they, they're our own speech and language therapists, but they asked others to do the assessment. Scoring outcome in this traffic light system using the CAPS-A protocol, so where green is normal or and red is ab severely abnormal. Um, and in uh, this was 391 palate repairs. Um, they were selected. I had no part in selecting what they looked at. And uh, looking at these patients at the age of five years, and 2.6% had already had VPI surgery. And the, those independent speech pathologists felt that a further 2.6% needed VPI surgery. And these are the ones where, as you can see at the top there, the ones, the, the moderate, there's no severe, but there's a, a, a small number of moderate hypernasality that, that those speech pathologists felt would benefit from surgery. Looking at long-term outcomes, looking at 62 of, of, of complete unilateral clefts, um, uh, age 20, uh, on whom I'd operated, 11% um, had had VPI surgery, um, three before the age of 10 years, four between the ages of 10 and 20. You don't know your results until the age of 20. There's a, a, a group of patients who, as the adenoid shrink and the maxilla uh, and the pharynx changes shape, who, uh, who were okay at five or maybe at 10, but not at 20. So this was in those 20 year olds. Um, and as, so already seven of those had had BPI surgery. There were still just a few with some, with some mild and moderate, uh, two with moderate hypernasality. Again, independently assessed, not by our own speech pathologists. Uh, just a few cases of a few patients with um, nasal emission and nasal turbulence. 
This is a, a series of, just to show some other outcomes. <clears throat> this is some patients uh, operated on by Felicity Mahendley, uh, just recently president of the International Meeting in Edinburgh. And her results are better than mine. Um, very impressive outcomes. Um, and these were her results. Um, 5% fistula, which is better than me. Um, and very few, this is at, up to the age of seven years, very few requiring secondary surgery. <clears throat> this is a, um, a, a French comparative study um, in the Journal of Cranium, Cranium Maxillofacial Surgery in 2015, comparing four French centers and um, their conclusion was that the two-stage palatoplasty, including radical intravillar plasty, seemed to have less negative effects on maxillary growth and good, good speech outcomes. This was a very interesting study from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, you may know that in 1988, Jeffrey Marsh published a paper showing that intravillar veloplasty did not improve palate, uh, speech outcomes. He then visited me, um, and he also, I think, visited cord cutting in New York and, and adopted a more radical intravillar veloplasty technique. And this was a review of the patients, his original group of patients who had not had any sort of uh, intravillar veloplasty, a group who'd had what he had looked at and said didn't benefit the patients, which was the Creans technique, and then the more radical the outcome from the more, more radical uh, intravillar plasty. But also, very interestingly, there was a difference in audiometric outcomes, in hearing outcomes, uh, with the radical muscle repair producing more normal uh, audiograms at age, at age of three. And another paper showing the same sort of outcome um, in the cleft palate journal, cleft palate craniofacial journal, uh, one group of patients who had uh, bow wardle kilner repair and the other that had the more radical muscle repair and uh, significantly lower incidence of uh, lo uh, need for, for uh, ventilation tubes. Uh, a, a recent paper uh, just recently published in the International Journal of Pediatric Rhinolaryngology. Again, the same finding. Um, the more radical muscle repair, this was Greet Hens who worked with us was uh, doing, I think, a lot of these cases. Um, normal middle ear function in 40% compared with 26% in the, in the previous technique. So can we now say that palate repair with radical muscle correction improves eustachian function and hearing? I think we can. I think the evidence is that, and there are other papers showing the same outcome. So we have in our consent form, we say, what's the benefit of the operation? And I used to say speech and function. I now say, and probably hearing in this technique. A few questions. Is one operation the right for every surgeon? Probably not. I know many surgeons like the furlough uh, and obviously get good results from it. And it's not for me to say that that's, they shouldn't be doing it. If that's the operation that works for them, then fine. It's a, it's a more anatomical rather than an, uh, sorry, a more geometrical rather than an anatomical repair. It's a kind of different sort of operation, but uh, I know that there are surgeons who, who extend it and there, um, Chi Bing from China, who my old friend from a long way back, as I know he's been producing a paper on what he calls the summer lad furlough. You know, it's a, it, it's a combination. It's a, it's a, Z plasties with a more radical muscle repair. But whatever the operation, the surgeon needs to understand the anatomy. So if you're doing furloughs, you need to know 
where the nasal mucosa is. You need to know where the levator is. You need to know which muscle is platypharyngeus and which is levator. Should we do a tensor phenotomy? Uh, I think there's, there's no, I've already shown evidence that this operation, which includes a tensor phenotomy, seems to improve middle ear function. And that this is just to show again, what should we do with this, with the plate of pharyngeus, that circumferential part and the descending part? Should we overcorrect the position of the levator? Because the, the cleft palate is shorter than the normal palate, should we be pushing it further back? I, I, I do so, in fact. Um, and, if, and, and my palates, if you look at them on lateral video, whereas a normal might be like that, my, my, mine are often looking more like that because they are shorter, but making maximum use of the length of the palate. How radical should that muscle correction be? This was a, a paper by Andrade Zanel looking, kind of subdividing intravelar velar plasty because people say, I do an intravelar velar plasty. That can mean anything. Um, and, and, and many surgeons do what they might call an IVV, which would be very different from what I do. Should submucous cleft palates be treated differently? Uh, I don't treat them differently, but there is more of an argument. Undoubtedly, the need for secondary surgery is higher, partly because they're older. The final message, message I'd like to put across is that the surgeon is probably more important than the technique. Um, and that's now being shown that surgical technique is really important. It's also important to do good numbers of operations. You need to be doing this operation regularly and you need to know your outcomes. And I know in many parts of the world, that's very difficult to achieve. If you have any questions, um, please do email me at, uh, uh, happy to engage in discussion. And now over to the panel. Thank you so much, Dr. Samalad, uh, for the very comprehensive lecture on cleft palate repair. So we would like uh, to invite our panelists to comment now, and we'll start alphabetically with Dr. Frank Cheng. Dr. Cheng? Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Somana. It's nice to uh, meet you again. I think I meet you uh, first time 15 years ago in India during the meeting. During that time, you, you gave me the video. And uh, there's a period that I do a palate repair at one time and one day, and uh, really has a very hard uh, neck pain. Since then, I, I, I have experience for one uh, period with uh, uh, microscopic, uh, but I do microscopic fellow uh, palatoplasty. It's really relief for neck pain. So uh, thank you for the uh, introduction of the idea that I strike neck using microscope. And uh, I, I want to uh, comment also that very few surgeons in the world that can share 20 years follow up and they, that really uh, a very good uh, long-term start. I think we might have just lost Dr. Chang. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, uh, you don't hear back. me? Yeah, 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 okay. Sorry, it's sorry. Okay, uh, let me... Uh, let me share uh, experience again that uh, uh, long, long time ago, I do uh, around eight to 10 palatoplasty per day. And that really has a, a very terrible neck pain. I have a rehabilitation for a full year. So there's a period I use uh, microscope doing fellow palatoplasty. And the, thank you for the the idea that your neck can be straightened with a microscope that really relieve the neck pain. And that's a good uh, technique. And uh, another is a uh, few surgeons can share 20 years uh, experience. So thank you, a very good uh, study. And uh, there's one question that 
in one meeting you show that the boma flap do not affect facial growth uh, until posterior, but narrow the, the, the half highlight uh, arch. Do you have any comment about that? Um, sorry, let me just... Um, um, <clears throat> we are in the process of looking at that. Um, I, I, uh, up to the age of 15, we have not shown uh, an effect on maxillary growth from the from the uh, uh, vermeran flap. So I, I began using the vermeran flap in 1993. So we've looked at, a, at, at the cohort before and the cohort afterwards. And after the age of 15, no effect on growth. The only, um, but we are in the process of looking at the 20 year olds, because I think you need to, you need to wait that long. Um, and we will hopefully be able to report. Um, the only effect, and we have looked at the effect of the vermeran flap, the only dimension that's narrowed is the actual alveolar gut. The, the, the posterior palatal width, for example, is not affected. I'm in between the lip repair and the palate repair. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chen, for your comments. Uh, for our next panelist, I'd like to invite Dr. Fayad. Hello, Dr. Fayaz, you are muted. Yes. Hello. Thank you very much, Professor Brian Somerlad. It's very, uh, uh, very good morning from uh, Sunshian, Paraguay. And uh, excellent presentation. I have two or three questions which you have mentioned already. So what prompted you to get to radical dissection of the levator in your initial Please. Um, well, it was really, as I, as I said, when I was uh, um, a, a, a registrar, um, I, I used to, I started inspired by Piggott, who started endoscopy. I began endoscoping patients with VPI, and I could see that the levators were anterior. And so at that time, standard management for VPI was some form of pharyngoplasty. Um, and I suggested to my bosses, why not, you know, let me do some, or wh why not retropose the muscle, the levators and see if you can improve palate function. And they would sometimes say to me, well, you go and do that. So I did them and that's where I learned how to do it. So that was, and it was really from, from doing secondary re-repairs or secondary palate repairs that I then moved to doing them primarily. So thank you very much. And what was the VPI percentage before and after your radical dissection of the levators? I'm sorry, what was the first part of that question? The VPI rate. What was the VPI percentage before and after your radical dissection of levators? Um, well, I can't really answer that. Um, the, uh, I, I mean, I, I've, it's been, I've just slowly become more radical. I'm probably not, not very much changed in the last 10 years or so, but I've shown you some papers from other, other surgeons. For example, uh, I was in uh, Rio a couple of weeks ago and um, Dale uh, from uh, Toronto showed David Fisher's outcomes. David Fisher came to, to visit, um, I think in something like 2008 and and he showed his results before and after he did the more, matic, the more radical repair. Jean-Claude Talmont is showing the same. I showed those other papers from France and so on. So I think from Jeff Marsh as well. So other people have shown that when they made that step change, you know, that was quite a big change, then they saw improvement in outcome. I can't really show that because it's, uh, I haven't suddenly changed. Okay, the last question is, do you feel the surgical microscope is really necessary to get a radical dissection of the levators? Well, <clears throat> essential is a strong word. I, 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 when I, for example, I was recently in Egypt and I, the microscope was not, work, not functional and I, I used loops. 
but I just lived with a headlight. <clears throat> but I just don't feel so comfortable, you know. It's just when you're used to using the microscope and how well you can see the anatomy, it's difficult to, to go back. Um, but of course, you know, there are places there are places that don't have microscopes and there's no there's no choice. But um, I would always, always use the microscope if I if I could. Now there is a new possibility. David Gillette from from Perth, Australia, showed using the the um, image the cap. It's a uh, I forget the name of the, the, the device, but it's a camera um, erected above the, the the palette, and you actually operate on the screen. And that uh, um, you're using the, the the screen as your as your image. Very impressive pictures. So that that may be an alternative, although that's a very expensive bit of equipment. But um, I. I just strongly recommend the microscope. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fayyad. Uh, and next, I'd like to invite Dr. Kyutoku. Hi, Dr. Domaran. Nice to see Hello. you. Thank you for your lecture congratulations i'm very happy to see your lecture you are comprehensive and understandable english i had many questions before you talk like uh when you start feeding after surgery or uh, tramezamic acid for breathing and uh choose of uh technique for depends on widths of the palate or knife instead of scissors some others but everything is cleared now for, from your lecture i have uh some question left is that uh level of the flaps you leave some uh, periosteum left beneath the uh, bone, especially the uh, distal part. And uh, another question is uh, your excellent result, like uh, ONF just uh, 5%, and BPI, 11% is very uh, excellent, I think. You have any uh, special uh, procedure for o ONF uh, with very wide one? And BPI, and you, how, how procedure you choose? Uh, pharyngeal flap or just uh, injection of uh, adipose dish or s some others. Thank you. Okay, well, um, so my, my personal, the 5% the, the, the BPI rate I showed you was actually Felicity Mahendli. Mine, I'm afraid, is a little higher than that. Um, so my BPI rate is, at the age of five years is 5%. Um, mm -hmm. But if you follow those patients up to the age of 20, it'll be more than 5%. I would say 10% is my, my best guess. And my fistula rate overall is about 10%, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so Felicity is better than, better than me. Um, as far as secondary management is concerned, um, I, if, if the levators of, if the, the, the muscle's not been corrected, then re-repair. If um, if the palate if, if if the muscles if the palate is too short, mm -hmm. um, but the muscle has been adequately corrected, then most often now Buck's native flap lengthening of the palate with mm -hmm. with two Buck's native flaps, one on the nasal side, one on the oral side. If the palate's too short but the muscles are still anterior, then I would combine a re-repair 
a muscle dissection plus buccinator fluff. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another technique, but I won't I won't talk about it now because it's a, it's a sort of new I idea. But so the, the message is try to improve the palate if possible. And I, I don't do many pharyngoplasties. If I do, they're mainly Heinz pharyngoplasties, building up the posterior pharyngeal wall. Um, in a few cases, rare cases with big sagittal gaps, then a midline pharyngeal flap if there's reasonable lateral pharyngeal wall, wall movement. But I try to avoid the, 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 the midline pharyngeal flap. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Kutoku. And our next speaker is Dr. Seward. Well, good morning, good evening, Mr. Summerlad. It's always a pleasure hearing you talk about palate repair. Hello, um, James. How are you? Uh, well, you know, obviously your your philosophies have shaped my choice of technique, you know, quite fundamentally in terms of how I do my palate repairs. I have a couple of questions for you though. Um, when you're putting the muscle together, obviously you talked about the four stitches that you use. How do you determine what's too loose, what's too tight? What are you aiming for in terms of the, the ideal tension on that repair? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know is the answer to that question. Um, I would rather it was too loose than too tight in the sense that it's, you know, there are occasionally in a very wide palate, you really worry that, the, that, that there's just too much tension and there's too much possibility of the, of the stitches disrupting. Um, but yes, uh, um, I, I, I take, I don't overlap, but I, I do placate inevitably by taking pretty wide stitches. But James, I, you know, I don't know the answer. I think um, interestingly, I, we don't really understand what the platypharyngeus does. And, right. and, and I, I, so, this technique that I'm sort of trying to publish of what I call PPAP, posterior pillar augmentation platyplasty, involves actually dividing the platypharyngeus, the, the, the descending fibers of the platypharyngeus, and you get better elevation. Um, so, you know, whether the, those descending fibers of the platypharyngeus are synergistic in some way with the, 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 the levator or they're actually antagonistic and better divided. I, d I don't know. Um, but yes, it would be great if we could actually measure that tension, but, but well, I don't, I can't. Okay. And another quick question for you. Um, in terms of the, the anterior palate, I know that you, you don't like the, the Bardak technique um, and I use it very, very rarely, but the the time when I still do use it is when I have a patient that someone else has done the lip repair and they haven't had a Voma flap or um, in the in the bilateral cleft when I've done a Voma flap on one side and not the other. Um, how do you manage that that very anterior part of the hard palate into the into the primary palate without seeing the flaps anteriorly? Yeah, well, I, I've with my aversion to, to, to dividing anteriorly. I, I try to elevate the, 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 the Voma as much as possible. I, I um, extend the, ant, the, the Langenbeck incisions you know, as far forward as I can. I would tend to accept in some cases that there is a small anterior defect and close it with time of alveolar bone grafting. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Seward. And next, I'd like to invite Dr. Steinberg. <clears throat> Hi, uh, thanks so much, Mr. Semelad, for uh, your lecture and all your contributions. Um, I want to ask uh, about the lateral relaxing incisions. And I've asked this question of a number of cleft surgeons, but one of the overriding principles in your uh, work, as well as uh, that of my friend, Dr. Bob Mann, would be that, of course, the, the scar from the lateral relaxing incisions uh, can create secondary problems such as maxillary hypoplasia, et cetera. But uh, for those of us that are doing a lot of cleft orthognathic surgery, uh, you know, I would say over hundreds of cases, I can count on my hands the, the few number of cases that 
we do for isolated cleft palate. So why is it that uh, we should expect that rather than a transverse arch collapse, which we can understand, why would the lateral relaxing incisions or how, do they, how does that contribute to an AP growth restriction problem? Mm. Well, I don't know that it does uh, as, the, as the answer. Uh, I mean, it's a, lo it's, a, it's a longitudinal incision, uh, a longitudinal scar. No, I don't know. Um, and, and so when, we're, when we compare my cases pre-vomerone flap and post-vomerone flap, the difference is that the, uh, the vomerone flap patients have had fewer, far fewer lateral releasing incisions, but they have had the vomerone flap. So they've had one potentially negative effect on maxillary growth and one potentially positive effect. Um, uh, uh, and you know we can't. I, we'll never be able to separate those two. If that's sorry, I'm not sure if that's clear. But um, so the answer is I, I don't know. I mean I, I'm not too. I think probably I've been too cautious to do the lateral releases, and I uh, uh, and probably if I'd been more radical, uh, do, do, done them more often, I would have a better fistula rate. So um, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's a big. I don't think it's a big deal, probably. And then just to follow up on that, the vomer flaps, uh, are you describing cephalically based flaps off the septal mucosa that flip up towards the nasal or a caudally based flap from the palate that flips towards the oral? No, cranially based and, and okay. single layer, um, cranially based, inserted underneath overlap, uh, un inserted underneath the oral mucoperiosteum. As described, by Pischler originally, and then popularized by the Oslo team. Someone's asked in the chat about whether, about the Oslo technique. And so the, the Vomerone flap is, is as per Oslo. Got it, got it. And then my last question is, um, if you have, let's say your own child uh, born with an isolated cleft palate, based on your years of experience and everything you've seen, what age would you do the repair? In other words, is earlier the earlier the better? Would you conclude now? Six months, or... I think. Okay. Six months before twelve months. I think the evidence is good. <laughs> but the, the recent, you know, there is a recent TOPS trial. I don't know if you if you know about it. Um, done in centres in Scandinavia and the UK, timing of palate surgery, and it was six months versus twelve months using, and the technique that they decided to to standardise was my technique. So. We, we, we'll get the answer to that. Um, we had some preliminary answers in Edinburgh. Uh, I don't, I, well, I, I, I don't, I haven't seen enough of the outcomes to really answer. My impression was that perhaps the six month was a little bit better from a VPI point of view, but I don't know. Um, that we'll hopefully get that answer in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steinberg. And I know that's the end of our panel list, but I'd like to invite Dr. Lowe, Professor Lowe, would you like to comment? Uh, hi, Brian. It's uh, good to see you again. And very nice to hear your talk. And I really appreciate your contribution of doing the pilot repair and identify the muscle, dissect the muscle, and then uh, adequately reconstruct the muscle so you get a very nice result and thank you for that. Uh, I still remember that a uh, long time ago you visited Changgen and you demonstrate uh, dissect the muscle under the operating microscope and then we wish to try to learn from your technique okay and but uh, to me it's very difficult to uh, you know the palate so palate is so small uh, if I dissect the, the mucosa from both sides and the muscle in the middle, uh, so difficult to keep a, a, a healthy nasal mucosa. So very frequently, I had the mucosa tear. So uh, at last, I, I stopped using this uh, three-layer dissection. Uh, instead, I use a, 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 a double opposing Z plus Z. But I use a small Z plus Z, just enough to dissect the muscle and, and the muscle attached to one side of the mucosa. So I can have uh, a more, uh, you know, uh, solid, adequate tissue that I can suture with confidence. 
and not uh, loosening, uh, not uh, very fragile, uh, no, uh, uh, no oralness of fistula. So, so I I do uh, differently with your technique, but I do appreciate that in your last slide that that uh, uh, a surgeon choose his uh, comfortable technique, and if you can achieve a good uh, result, then uh, then, then then do it. But I do very appreciate your contribution to teach us how to, you know, to identify and dissect and reconstruct the muscle. Thank you very much. I remember that uh, visit, that particular, I've been to Changgang a couple of times, but that time uh, Sam Nordoff was doing the palate repair. And he said to me, uh, why don't you scrub and do the muscle on one? On one side, <laughs> which was an interesting and challenging experience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo. And um, I guess we'll now go to our Q and A session. So um, our first question is from Dr. Pathak, and he wants to ask if you have any previous experience using the angulated loops and whether um, how it compares to using a microscope. Um, the answer is no, I haven't used it. I haven't used them. Okay. And uh, I'll go to our next question. Our, our next question is from Dr. Fantima. And um, the question is, why do you choose to do a palatal repair at six months? And I know you previously answered um, to this question when Dr. Steinberg commented um, during the panelist section, but would you like to expand on that a little bit? Yes, the, the, the principle was that babies begin to babble at six months. So they're uh, up to the age of six months, they're mainly producing vowel sounds and they begin to experiment with, you know, birds and ders and, 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 and consonant sounds at about six months. That's the principle. And, and it seemed to me that um, if you can have a functional palate at that, at that time, that's, uh, that seems to make sense. But as I say, we're, we're, we're waiting to see what the, what the TOPS trial shows. There, there is another practical reason, which is that in the UK, um, most many mothers have six months of maternity leave. <laughs> and so they're very keen to have um, uh, the, the palate done while, the while they're on maternity leave. And thirdly, mm -hmm. there are no teeth. And teeth get, get in the way a bit. You know, they, they obstruct the view a bit. So those are three reasons. Okay, thank you. And our next question is from Dr. Wu Senya. And the question is that... Um, do you have previous experience with late repairs, for example, like an eight-year-old with a complete cleft? Yeah. And what is the outcome compared to regular patients at like a younger age? Yes, I I I, I have less experience, obviously, than 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 people who work all the time in in low and middle income countries. But I have done a fair number of late repairs. Uh, I think it, it, well, firstly, and I chaired a, a, an international working group, which reported in PR, in uh, the Cleft Palate Journal. Um, the general, and with people like Josh the Murti from, from um, Chennai and uh, Nivaldo Alonso and people from around um, Mukunda Reddy, people from around the, the world. And the consensus was that it is worth doing. And that the patients do have some benefit, but that that you, you they 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 may not be normal, and it depends at what age you do them. So an eight-year-old is obviously better than an eighteen-year-old. It depends on their articulation. So you you see some patients le with late presentations who are, have developed good articulation despite their cleft palate. Uh, so they'll tend to get have much better results than the patient with the glottal with everything down here. Um, and, and, and thirdly, there, if you look at some late palate repairs, you look in the mouth and you get them to say, ah, some unrepaired palates, 
Some of them are really, you can see the muscles really working, the pharyngeal muscles working, the levators working. Um, others seem to have given up. So from, on first principles, I, I would anticipate that, you know, the patient with the, with the good active muscles is going to get a better result than the one without. Okay, and um, also uh, Dr. Seward commented on our first question. He said that uh, he uses angulated loops for all his palate repairs, but then he still used the operating microscope for the muscle dissection. So his comment is that if you haven't tried it, um, he would suggest you to give it a try and you'll probably love it. <laughs> and our next and my, question- my, And just one, one point to add to that. Yes. Don't give up after the first- time I, 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 had it, I tried in about 1985 I think um, you know tried once or twice thought oh this is just too much hassle do 10 you know do, do enough to, to to get over the, the teething period try and make it simple if you can avoid having the big drape over the top that takes more time try and keep it simple but but do you know do a give it a proper trial Thank you, Dr. So most surgeons in the UK now use the, use the microscope. Okay, and our next question is from Dr. Honda. Uh, he wants to ask whether um, you could explain why you quit ventilation tube insertion at the time of pellet repair. Sorry, what was the first bit of that question? Um, he wants to know why you quit using a ventilator tube insertion at the time of pellet repair. Why, why we stop? Because... Yes. Because, because it appears that this radical muscle dissection improves eustachian function. And because the sort of tubes that you put in, the mini tubes that, that you, you can insert at the age of say six months, usually have a lifespan of about six months. So they come out. If they don't, they can leave scars or perforations. Um, so, so they have a temporary effect only. Um, and if you can avoid them and avoid those scars in the tympanic membrane, it would seem to me a good idea. Okay, and Dr. Shetty would like to ask you, what is your opinion on nasal back cut in palatal repair and whether it would be one of the causes leading to fistula? Nasal back cut. I'm not sure what what yeah. that means. Not exactly what that. I'm not exactly sure what that means either. Um, Doctor Shetty, are you online? Hello, Doctor Shetty. Okay. I think okay. Then I, think I yeah. guess we'll continue to our next question then from uh, Doctor She from Singapore. Um, he would like to know whether you have any experience using a cellular thermal matrices for complicated fistula repairs. Yeah, um, I don't. Um, I've got a sort of aversion to um, to, to, to non-biological material. Um, and interestingly, I think talking to Joe Losey recently, who was a great enthusiast for Alloderm, I think that he's pretty well stopped using it um, uh, uh, and, and feels that it does produce scar tissue. So now if I, if I have a difficult fistula, I'll use control cartilage as a spacer. But, you know, the sort of fistula that you get with this technique are, 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 are usually just slit fistulae or, or pinhole fistulae. So they don't need anything very elaborate. Okay, so I think that all our questions already be answered by Professor Summerlin. Okay, I I I see. I think we Dr. had a Dr. Shetty. Is a from Dr. Shetty. Yeah, please, Dr. Shetty, go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello. It, it was it was a wonderful lecture, Dr. Uh, Summerlin. So my question was, uh, uh, I have seen a couple of surgeons doing the nasal back cut, like uh, where the muscle also comes with it. Uh, probably in mission surgeries and then close the or oral layer so directly so uh, if you see it in a uh, uh, the uh, coronal view then there is no nasal layer at the there is no nasal layer closure so there is directly the oral layer 
beneath the okay. uh, so so there is just one layer closure in that in the junction between the hard palate and the soft palate where where we are supposed to have three layers so i want to know if uh, any of you have had any experience with that and uh, if that would lead to a uh, fistula formation or so well i i haven't done that um although i know that uh, some people say you don't need to close the nasal layer um and i don't think it's necessary because i think if you get in that plane that i've tried to show you you can leave the nasal mucosa intact but um and, and, and with its little vascular plexus but simply remove the scent uh, dissect the muscle back so I, I don't see it's necessary okay thank you okay so if there is no more questions the uh, I, I have to say thank you very much, Professor Summerlin. Yeah, uh, since I invited you two months ago, uh, I, you always keep in contact with me uh, with the several uh, very tiny things, and but you're always very kind to answer me. Uh, yeah, so I actually learned from your attitude a lot, uh, of course. Yeah, and uh, today, um, be, on behalf of all the 150, I think the student, I think we are all your student uh, in so far so now uh from learn from you so we i think all, all of us really get uh, a lot of the lesson yeah not, not only from your your great manners or your wonderful technique and uh, you have a very good attitude to know your outcome is good or not that is uh all the students should should learn from you also so i think time is uh now we have to go into our the final session i need to invite all our participants to show you a smile and the priest turn on your screen and i would like to invite you to have a good photo with professor brian somerled okay please and i will come to three and uh, give me a very beautiful smile one two cheese great and uh, let's go to the next page okay so please one, two, cheese. Thank you. And uh, the third page. Today we have a lot of participants. I am so busy and control all your entry and uh, you are logging out. So <laughs> please allow me. And uh, next page. One, two, cheese. Okay, thank you. So thank you, Professor Brian. And thank you all my five very important uh, panelist, uh, Professor Jordan Stamper, Professor Fayas, Professor Frank Chen, Professor Jem Siu, and Professor Kyotoku. Looking forward to see you on our coming webinar. That is next week, our next uh, master course. Today is the first one. Next week is the, our second one. Uh, our speaker is the Professor Harper. Yeah. So he will talk a uh, lecture about how to treat the treacherous calling syndrome. So good morning and good evening. Thank you for your coming. See you next time. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you, Professor Samalin. Pleasure. Thank you very much.